In the 1970s, in universities across the world, there was a nearly universal truth that if you liked computers, you probably also liked playing video games. And some of the earliest games were text-based adventure games. Equally universal was the want to play those games with other people. And so was created the multi-user dungeon, or MUD, or multi-user shared hallucination, or MUSH. If you think about Zork, imagine now that there's multiple people playing the same game. Sometimes there's combat, sometimes there's not, but the concept is simple. Several different rooms connected to each other through text directions. Exempli gratia, go east, go west, open the door, etc. et alia, and so on. And so it was in 1984 when Brad Leinberger developed his own MUD called Realm which, yeah, that's pretty generic, and perhaps unsurprisingly, there's not much information about it. Certainly, there's no screenshots, so here's a photo of bears in a tree. Now, that could be the end of the story, a game that was created by one guy and which some people played. But Brad had bigger aspirations for his title, and so he started working on upgrading Realm into a 2D, graphical mud. There were a few graphical games before this that he could use for inspiration, like Ultima, but none of them were multiplayer, so this was actually a pretty ambitious goal. In 1989, Brad would partner up with James Hettinger, the founder of a brand new company called Tantalus, and they would release Kingdom of Drakkar, a graphical mud. Now, you look at this, but how is it a mud? Sure, it's clearly rudimentary, but each segment here, each tile, is actually a room like it would be in a text-based game. And while graphics allow you to expand outwards a bit more and make it so you have some sense of depth and distance, it's essentially the same. Instead of typing go east, you just click on the tile to the east and move there, revealing whatever it is you can see in real time. Not exactly shocking stuff in the era of Fortnite, but the fact is that at the time, this was pretty neat stuff. Made only neater by the fact that this was multiplayer. Over 200 people could be playing in the world at the same time. Something that should shock anyone who's played PUBG and realize that modern games can't even get half as many players into a world seamlessly. Character creation isn't exactly Black Desert Online levels here, but you could select a gender, a race, and a class. And each race was actually different, with hidden attributes and special advantages. As far as classes, you could be any of the standard D&D-style basics. Fighter, barbarian, martial artist, mentalist, healer, or thief. I personally chose a city-dwelling thief, because could you imagine a thief in the fields? That's just silly! And of course, there's no reason to not be a thief, even though this game has hybrid classes like Fighter Mentalist and advanced classes like Paladin, none of which are a thief, but still, it's pretty impressive to have in the game at all in 1989. Then you take your thief and you travel around the lands, killing monsters, gaining experience, solving puzzles, and completing quests. Pretty standard fare for any RPG, except again, this was online with 200 other players, making Kingdom of Drakkar the first game quite like this. It's the first graphical, large-scale, over-the-internet, several-gamer RPG. A genre today we call G-L-S-O-T-I-S-G-R-P-G. Or Glottis Gerp. Of course, that isn't true. <laughs> no, but it is true that at the time that Kingdom of Drakkar was released, there wasn't really a name for these type of games. Thankfully, our good friends at Tantalus decided that there should be a name for these type of games, and they formed themselves into a brand new company, MPGNet, which stands for Multiplayer Games Network. In a meeting at this new company, they thought they had the name to describe Kingdom of Drakkar. First, compared to other games out at the time, which had maybe eight players, well, in comparison, Drakkar was massive. 
It was obviously important to explain that the game was multiplayer, and not just couch multiplayer, but actually over the internet, so online needs to be in there as well. Plus, they really wanted to make it clear that this was a role-playing game, and suddenly, massively multiplayer online role-playing game, MMORPG, or Memorpaga if you're a fan of biscuits, was born. And so, not only was Drakkar the first MMORPG by virtue of being the actual first, but they're even technically correct by virtue of having coined the term. The best kind of correct. Originally, the game's graphical interface was 8-bit, but eventually that was upgraded to 24-bit, and then a legacy graphics option was introduced, meaning that you could jump back and forth between generations of graphics on the fly, without even having Toys for Bob do the work. MPGNet had around 3,000 paying subscribers, and this was back when you paid by the hour, as much as $5 per hour to play. A few years later, as the internet and AOL got a bit more competitive, that price would eventually go down to $9.95 a month, but the point is that people were paying a lot of money to play this game. Lineberger originally licensed your card to MPGNet, but as the number of subscribers slowly increased to 25,000, MPGNet bought the rights entirely. And Brad sort of faded away from the limelight. He started working on Kingdom of Drakkar 2, which was cancelled, but the work was ported into the original as an expansion pack. He tried making not just one, but two 3D Drakkars. And then he worked on a couple other games that weren't Drakkar at all, none of which saw the light. MPGNet, unfortunately, couldn't keep itself above board, and wasn't making the kind of profits that their competitors were. By 1998, AOL was worth $220 billion, and even other service-based companies were seeing massive growth. For example, Amazon had soared to $14.7 billion, and was rumored to be expecting $10 billion in revenue within 10 years. But little old MPGNet was having a hard time breaking $500,000 in profit. And so they would sell to Interactive Magic Entertainment, or iMagic, for about $3 million. Around this time, Brad left the company, but Drakkar stayed online, still pulling in subscription dollars every month. Between 2000 and 2002, these dot-com companies experienced a lot of hardships, however. First, a lot of tech companies were over-invested in due to worries that Y2K would destroy the planet, which did not happen. And when that did not happen, interest rates were very aggressively raised. Without access to easy and nearly infinite cheap capital, many tech companies were suddenly left without access to affordable credit. This partnered with the Japanese recession, sent tech stocks tumbling down. Adding on to this, Microsoft was found guilty of monopolization, and their stock began falling, and then Pets.com crashed just a few months after going public. The final nails in the tech bubble? The Enron scandal, WorldCom scandal, and Adelphia scandal, all of which solidified the idea that tech had been lying about everything. Needless to say, small MMO companies didn't fare any better, and Drakkar was on the chopping block until Brad, wonderful Brad, showed back up and purchased Drakkar back. This kept Kingdom of Drakkar online, but unfortunately the cash flow issues weren't significantly better with Brad back in charge, and he continued working on Drakkar in his spare time while also working in the industry. One MMO he worked on while in the role of CTO at Icarus Studios was Fallen Earth, which was positioned as a Fallout-style MMO with a focus on character building and story instead of endgame grind. Fallen Earth never really caught on outside of loyalists and eventually was sold to Gamers First in 2011, the same company that bought APB, All Points Bulletin, and released it as APB Reloaded. This was coincidentally also when Brad found himself no longer working on Fallen Earth, and therefore no longer with a conflict of interest, and development on Kingdom of Drakkar was able to become a focus once again. Over the years, Drakkar would expand out to over 250,000 tiles, annual events, and a remarkably stable, loyal fanbase 
of paying subscribers and both paid and free expansions. And even an Android version for mobile phones. If an Android version sounds remarkably recent for a game that was released in 1984, you're not wrong. Maybe you've missed all the other dates I've mentioned here, but as of 2020, Kingdom of Drakkar is still online, still playable, and still being updated pretty regularly. You can go right now and play it on your computer while letting my videos play in the background. I've included the links in the description, or you can download it on your Android as long as you've got the ability to sideload. And you can play it on your phone while you're watching my videos on repeat in picture on picture mode. Really, there's a lot of different ways you could play Kingdom of Drakkar while also increasing the amount of watch time for my channel, which you should have already subscribed to and click the bell because that's what YouTube demands that I say to you and that you actually do if I want to see any sort of success at all because this is a treadmill and if I slow down, I die. Please just click the bell already. Okay, thanks. I really love you a lot. This game is 36 years old old and not only can you still play it, but it's still online and still being updated by the original creator. That's just a crazy thing. And not only is it already the oldest MMO, not only is it the creator of the term MMO, not only is it the longest running MMO, not only is it one of the oldest still updated games, not only is it one of, if not the only game to still be updated by its original creator after 36 years? Not only is it one of the only games to change its entire graphics engine successfully, not only has it survived from when games were $5 an hour through to the free to play revolution, not only is it a survivor of the dot com bubble bursts and multiple mergers and acquisitions, which any of my viewers will know is basically a guarantee for that game to be shelved and killed like No One Lives Forever or Elite Force or anything from Sierra, but also it's actually fun. It's a fun little game that you can log into for a few minutes and putz around in, killing a few orcs and stealing their rubies before logging off and doing something else. It's so low impact and amazingly forward thinking that I would believe this was an indie game released today and it would probably even sell pretty well on Steam for $5. I would not be surprised to see someone playing it, except for the fact that it's over 30 years old. So check it out in the description, share this video around so other people can learn the history of the game, and we'll see you on the next one.